Good morning. Uh, could I call this meeting to order and ask, uh, I guess everybody's taking their seat already. I got in trouble for starting two minutes early last month, and I, I've been chastised twice this morning. So we're starting on time. And uh, the first thing on the agenda, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Miller, one of our representatives that's here. Glad to have you today. Uh, Denise Crosswhite Harden. Thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, Bobby Stem with uh, AOGC. Yes. But I, I, I will be nice today. I always say something tacky about him when I introduce. I think he does us a great job. One stop. One stop. <laughs> Bobby's a great guy. Uh, any other guests that I'm missing? We're glad to have all of you here out in the audience. And uh, at this time, uh, will you call the roll to see if we're all here? Mr. Coburn. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley here. Mr. Shannon. Shannon. Mr. Frymiller. Frymiller here. Mr. McCowan. McCowan here. Mr. Dyson. Dyson here. Mr. Alexander. Alexander here. Mr. LaForge. LaForge here. Mr. Peters here. <clears throat> that is a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you for all being here. At this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Secretary Gatz. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. A uh, couple of uh, announcements this morning to uh, go over. The first is uh, the FARO Award. The FARO Award is a partnership award between the Department of Transportation and the uh, AGC, and it recognizes the best construction constructed bridge in the state of Oklahoma uh, for the previous year. So uh, District 5, uh, Brent Omquist and his crew, uh, Commissioner Dyson, were the recipients of the FARO Award this year for the uh, Interstate 40 uh, State Highway 6 interchange that's on the screen there in front of you. A beautiful diverging diamond bridge, well constructed, uh, constructed by Frontier Bridge. And uh, again, project we're very, very proud of. And the, the FARO Award uh, comes from the FARO family who were uh, tremendous highway constructors across history. And uh, Kent FARO uh, served on the Transportation Commission in the early 90s. So uh, really great recognition for a great project. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could get you and, and Commissioner Dyson to come down, we'll get Brent and the, the guys up here for a photo op. Also this morning, Mr. Chairman, we've got a couple other recognitions. Melody Johnson is a 47 year employee of the Department of Transportation and she coordinates and works very closely with Keep Oklahoma Beautiful. And she has been recognized with an award from KOB uh, that's called the Towering Spirit Award. And that recognition uh, was very appropriate for Melody and the work that she's done. Uh, she does an exceptional job of coordinating everything from the trash poster calendar to uh, dealing with wildflower plots and, and things like that out on the highway system and the rights way. So uh, we very much appreciate Melody's service to the state of Oklahoma, uh, to the department, and really, really are thankful to have somebody like her directly interacting with Keep Oklahoma Beautiful on our behalf. So uh, again, Melody, congratulations, and thank you so much for all you do. And one more uh, for women in transportation, and Don Sullivan was the 2020 uh, Woman of the Year for WTS. Uh, the WTS awards banquet last year, unfortunately, wasn't able to be accomplished. So uh, they did recognize her last week. And uh, we are so proud of Dawn and all of the things that she's done across her career for the Department of Transportation. 
And uh, again, Women in Transportation, WTS, uh, Women's Transportation Seminar, uh, that group is a national group. Uh, we have a very strong Oklahoma chapter. And again, that's recognition uh, for Dawn that is uh, certainly worthwhile. And uh, we're really glad to have her on the Department of Transportation team. So congratulations, Dawn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pass this down to Bob. We need a signature on that. Uh, item number 161 is approval of the minutes of the November meeting. Uh, do I hear a second? Would you please call the roll? Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. I was absent, so I'll abstain. Mr. Fray Mueller. Yes. Mr. McCowan. Yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander yes. Mr. LaForge. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. That's it. The majority carries. We had eight out of nine. Uh, the uh, next item on the agenda is a consent docket. Uh, this item was discussed earlier in the subcommittee meetings. If any commissioners would like to pull an item out of the discussion, you may do so at this time. Mr. Chairman, item number 165C needs to be removed from the consent docket due to a fire. Okay. Uh, do I, are we going to discuss that? Or is it just being taken off the consent docket completely. Take it completely off. Taking it completely off. Okay. Uh, I, I need a motion for the approval of the consent docket minus num number 165. Motion by Dyson. Second. All in favor. C, what's the G, yes. Yeah. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll on the consent docket? Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Fry Miller. Fry Miller, yes. Mr. McCallan. McCallan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. LaForge. LaForge, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. That was a unanimous vote. Uh, item number 166 is a programming item. Mr. Tigler, you're recognized to present. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Mr. Secretary. Item 166, I have one programming item this month. This is in Tulsa County and Commission District 8. Department requests approval to program a project to repair vehicle impact damage to New Haven Avenue over State Highway 11. The estimated cost of this project is $35,000 and the project can be ready for a March 2022 letting. Party responsible for the damage is known. Approval is recommended. Try to answer any questions if you have any this morning. You've heard the presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? <laughs> Second. Second, Coburn. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Frymiller. Frymiller, yes. Mr. McCowan. McCowan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. LaForge. LaForge, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Passed by unanimous vote. Mr. Tigley, you may continue with item number 167. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item 167, I have five parts this month. Part A is a statewide. All districts are on-demand biological assessments and studies. Department has selected five firms to provide this service. They are Blackbird Environmental, Cox McLean Environmental Consulting, Environmental Solutions and Innovations, HDR Engineering, and Olson. The aggregate not to exceed amount for these five contracts is $1,250,000. Part B is Seminole County and District 3. The department has selected H.W. Lochner for our construction plans for US 270. The total not to exceed amount is $240,700. The project is in the eight-year construction work plan and scheduled let date of in 2027. Part C in Dewey County, District 5. 
The department has selected Olson for our construction plans for US 60. The total not to exceed amount is $196,680. This project is also included in the eight year construction work plan with a scheduled let date of 2027 as well. Part D in Kiowa County. The department has selected Poe and Associates to prepare construction plans for State Highway 54. Total not to exceed amount is $263,800. This project is also in the eight year construction work plan, scheduled let date of 2027 as well. And finally, Part E in Tulsa County in District 8. The department has selected Poe and Associates to prepare uh, preliminary engineering and construction plans for US 75. Total not to exceed amount is $3,549,785. This project is also included in the eight-year construction work plan with a scheduled let date in 2027 as well. Approval is recommended. Try to answer any questions if you gentlemen have any this morning. You've heard the presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? Peterson, to approve. Prime member, second. Second. Madam Secretary, please uh, call the roll. Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Tanner. Yes. Mr. Brian Miller. Brian Miller, yes. Mr. McCallum. McCallum, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. George. George, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Passed by my, my unanimous. Uh, Mr. Tigley may continue to item number 168. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item 168, I have three parts this month. Part A is a statewide all districts are on-demand bridge assessments. They are with Olson, Poe & Associates, Perky Pile Engineering, and Walter P. Moore & Associates. Total aggregate increase for, this, for these contract supplements is $1 million. Part B is Rogers County in District 8. Department previously authorized Benham Design to form preliminary engineering and final design plans for the I-44 US 412 project. Supplement not to exceed amount is $1,502,100. This project is in the eight-year construction work plan with a scheduled let date of uh, 2024. And finally, Part C in Ottawa County and District 8 as well. Department previously authorized Garber, form engineering, preliminary engineering, and final design plans for US 60 over Spring and Neosho River. Supplement not to exceed amount is $127,223.10. This project, uh, these projects are in the eight year construction work plan and approval is recommended. Try to answer any questions this morning if you have any. You've heard the <coughs> presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? <coughs> Do I have a second? Second, Brian Miller. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Coburn, <coughs> yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Tanner. Yes. Mr. Brian Miller. Brian Miller. Callan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. George, yes. Yes. Thank you. Passed by unanimous. Uh, it, it, it just was brought to my attention. I missed a guest this morning. Uh, Secretary Patterson, uh, former director of the department, we're glad to have you today. Um, item number 169 is uh, the change orders with cumulative totals less than 75,000. We'll have by the engineering department that presentation. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Mr. Secretary. Uh, John Leonard couldn't be here today, so I'm filling in for him. I would like to present uh, item number 169, parts A through double P. These are the change orders on projects which have a cumulative total of change orders of $75,000 or less. Uh, this item is presented for your information only and no action is necessary, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. We had quite a discussion over this. Anyone have any questions over those items? If not, you may continue to item number 170. Okay, I would like to present item 170, parts A through double I. These are the change orders on projects which have a cumulative total of change orders greater than $75,000. Your approval is recommended and I would be glad to answer any questions. You've heard the presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? Peterson, second. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Dyson. Primary, yes. Mr. McCallum. McCallum, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. LaForge. LaForge, yes. Mr. Peterson. 
Yes. Thank you, sir. Item number 171 is uh, proposed bid openings. Uh, Mr. Hackney, you're recognized to present. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. Item 171, proposed bid openings, consists of the final February 2022, the tentative March 2022, and the tentative April 2022 bid openings. The department recommends approval. You've heard the presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? Second. Do I, and I have a second? Okay. The secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Freimiller. Freimiller, yes. Mr. McCallan. McCallan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Yes. Mr. Ford. Ford, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. That passed unanimous. Thank you. Item 172 is a request for additional appropriations on emergency bridge repair. Mr. Davis, you can present. Morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, Sean Davis, Director of Operations, presenting agenda item number 172. This is a request for additional appropriations on an emergency bridge repair project in the amount of $66,000. Uh, this is the emergency repair project on the Roosevelt Bridge over Lake Texoma in uh, Bryan and Marshall counties that uh, the Commission approved back in June. Uh, approval is requested for additional appropriations necessary to fund additional repairs discovered during construction. Uh, the next scheduled inspection of the bridge was performed during the emergency project, and after reviewing the findings of the inspection, Bridge Division and Field District 2 agreed that eight additional locations needed to be addressed by adding another floor beam in addition to the 200 already in the existing contract. Also, upon inspection of the work, it was discovered that 16 new floor beams were not placed in the correct locations due to a misunderstanding of the stationing in the plans. It was determined that the 16 additional floor beams provided value for the remaining life of the bridge, so it was agreed uh, to leave them in place at a reduced price. Uh, the change requires additional appropriations in the amount of $66,000 and extends the completion date for this contract from August 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2021 to complete the additional work. Uh, the department approves recommend, uh, recommends approval of this item. I'll be happy to answer any questions that y'all have. You've heard the presentation. Do I have a motion for approval? So Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion or question? Just a question. All this yes, work's sir. been completed? It is. Yeah. It is done. Yes, sir. Right. It seems odd to be approving it at this time. Uh, just, just the additional appropriation. For, it was an emergency contract, so it wasn't kept in our system. So I had to come back to you to ask for the additional appropriation. Yeah. All right. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Frymiller. Frymiller, yes. Yeah. Mr. McCallan. McCallan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. LaForge. LaForge, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Dels, <clears throat> you're, you may present item number 171. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Uh, item 173 are recommendations uh, for awards. My presentation will be in two parts. Part A is regarding the referral we made last month. Uh, the following item referred to by call order was deferred from the October 14th bid opening. It is now recommended at this time that that project be awarded. And that's call order 180. Part B are the recommendations from the November 18th bid opening. It's recommended that the following items from that bid opening referred to by call order be awarded. That's call orders 400. 405, 410, 420, 435, 445, 448, 455, 460, 465, 475, 480 with add alternate one only, 485, 490, 495, 505, 510, 515, 520, 525, 530, 540, 545, 550, 553, 555, 565, 570, 575, 580, 585, 587, 595, 605, 610, 615, 620, and 625. It is recommended that the following items from the, from the November 18th bid opening refer, referred to by caller be rejected. And that's called it as 535, 582, and 600. This includes our recommendations, and your approval is requested. You've heard, you've heard the motion uh, for approval. 
Go ahead. Excuse me, Chief, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, would you mind just, I know this has gone over by the other committee, but for my own information, the, the reason for rejecting those other uh, bids? Sure. Give me just a second. 535. Significantly below the engineer's estimates. Yes. Okay, on call order 535, we had one bid on that project and we found what we thought was an error in the bid uh, that if, if it overran would significantly, would, it would be a significant change order. So we, uh, the city decided to reject that bid at this time. Okay. 582. That project was 55% overestimate and rejected it on that, on that reason. And they called it a 600. There were some plan errors that, uh, that were caught by some of the bidders and we were, was brought to our attention. Uh, and we felt that awarding at this time would just put, put us at a, at a risk. Um, and yeah, was that, it worth awarding at this time? I was time? wrong. That was the one that was below budget. Yes, sir. Or below plan, excuse me. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other discussion? So moved. Second. State before the second. Now, check her, please call the roll. Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shanna. Yes. Mr. Fry Miller. Fry Miller, yes. Mr. McCowan. McCowan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Alexander, yes. Mr. LaForge. LaForge, yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Passed by the unanimous vote. Uh, item number 174 is the director's report by Secretary Gatz. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, uh, I'll start by reading an emergency declaration into the record. The US 69 over Washington Street Bridge, uh, approximately 3.9 miles north of the junction of US 69 and US 70 in Bryan County, uh, was struck on November 24th of 2021 uh, by a vehicle traveling underneath, causing significant damage to approximately 30 feet of beam number two, located in span number two. The impact severely diminished the structural integrity and load carrying capacity required to support the deck weight and live loads carried above. Immediately upon impact, District 2 staff mobilized to shift traffic from the damaged beam by closing the outside lane of US 69. District staff, as well as ODOT Bridge Division, performed a hands-on up-close inspection. After completion of the inspection, it was determined that the best course of action was to close the lane and uh, above the damaged member. It's imperative for ODOT to return traffic to all the lanes of US 69 as soon as possible. For safety reasons, this will require the damaged portion of the structure to be repaired before traffic is restored. District forces do not have the capacity to perform the work. It's recommended that the emergency bridge project be started immediately to have the damaged member repaired and the traffic restored to all lanes. Uh, in accordance with Title 61 of the Oklahoma State Statutes, Section 130, and the Oklahoma Administrative Code, Section 731-5, Dash one, I am authorized, uh, I have authorized an emergency repair project for this structure. The estimated cost of repair is 125,000. We proceeded with the emergency repair project. Uh, Built Right Construction was the contractor. Uh, Ashley uh, Hawkins with District 2 advised us uh, late yesterday evening that the work was complete. And the lane, uh, we had traffic restored on that lane uh, this morning. So again, great job to the crew in District 2 and everybody with ODOT that uh, provided assistance on moving that forward so quickly. Uh, the cost was $39,000 and uh, we were able to again restore traffic quickly. So uh, appreciate the work of everybody involved in that. I want to talk just for a minute about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, again, there is a, uh, since that bill was signed into law in November, there's been a huge amount of confusion around what it does and what it does not do. Uh, the act includes a lot of different infrastructure investment, not just highways. Uh, it includes investments in water and sewer, 
Uh, it includes investments in uh, rail, uh, investments in broadband, so a lot of different moving parts in the bill. But Oklahoma did not receive an additional $5 billion in new money as a result. Uh, what the bill did was it took our highway reauthorization and rolled it up uh, into that Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So we did receive a five-year reauthorization uh, as a result of the passage. Uh, and that reauthorization includes uh, just over a billion dollars in new money. So looking at apportionment, uh, we went from 3.3 billion under the FAST Act up to about 4.3 billion under EJA. Uh, that those dollars are apportioned into some different funding categories, including a couple of new ones uh, that account for about uh, 225 million of that new money. Uh, one is called carbon reduction, uh, and one is called resilient operations. That's an abbreviation, it's a long title. But we don't have a lot of information about what will be involved in those programs, and there will be plenty of guidance uh, and policy that will be forthcoming, just as there is with every highway bill that passes. Uh, but again, I'm, I feel the need to continue to emphasize the fact that it, it was the expected reauthorization of the new highway bill uh, for a term of five years, uh, just as it normally is. Uh, and again, I don't wanna minimize the fact that there is some additional investment opportunity there. Uh, the department accepted a little bit of risk and we increased the federal funding projection in the construction work plan balancing that the commission considered in October and approved. Uh, we feel like we hit that number pretty close by the time that uh, the dust settles. Uh, and to compound the problems, uh, we have now a new continuing resolution that will run through February. Uh, that is predicated on not the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, but as I understand, uh, it'll be predicated on the previous FAST Act. So a tremendous amount of reconciliation is going to have to go on before we get a true picture of what the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act means for the highway program. Uh, so again, a lot of moving parts, tremendous amount of confusion. Uh, you know, we want to be excited about having that infrastructure investment opportunity, but it's hard to be too excited until we really understand what it means. So, again, I appreciate your patience with us uh, as we kind of continue to try to sort this out. Uh, and we will, I'll give you a monthly update, if not more regular than that, as information starts to come forth. So, uh, in Commissioner Grimsley, uh, asked us at the last commission meeting about uh, our weather systems and some of our winter weather preparation. So at this time, I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation I'd like to walk through uh, that the guys have put together and uh, talk a little bit about our winter weather, winter weather prep. So if we can get the PowerPoint pulled up on the screen, please. And this is a critical component of our intelligent transportation system and our ITS operations. So uh, next slide. The advanced traveler information system, and, and we're nothing if we don't have a lot of acronyms, uh, ATIS, ATIS. The public website for this particular map is oktraffic.org. And what it includes is speed data with real-time flow conditions for the entire state, including some of the principal arterials. Uh, it also identifies our construction work zones, uh, includes connectivity to 533 uh, closed circuit TV cameras, 103 dynamic message boards across the state, and 167 road weather sites 150 or vehicle counters that have temperature and camera view available also, uh, and 17 are advanced weather sites. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a minute. Uh, the speed data is depicted as green if traffic is flowing uh, greater than 50 miles an hour. Uh, yellow is a reduced speed, 25 to 50, 
uh, and then a facility that shows in red is a uh, stop and go condition with travel at less than 25 miles an hour. Uh, next slide is our work zones. And, and on our work zone slide, uh, this feature is live, but it is still under development. Uh, all construction projects and work zones will be located through the iPhone app uh, by ODOT field personnel. Uh, we're currently, we've got about 65 or 75% of all of those work zones in. Uh, all field divisions have been trained to use the application uh, and we expect to get this fully operational in uh, this year or shortly uh, in early 2022. The uh, window will zoom as shown on the screen to give you a better understanding. Uh, and as you zoom, the barricade icons transition showing the full project limits uh, modified as construction phases and changes occur. Uh, this map is updated. You can click on the work zone for a project description start date and any approved comments uh, from the construction engineer that might be needed. Uh, next steps will be calculating and providing current travel delay time for each work zone and provide dynamic expect, uh, provide the expected project end date uh, as contract days are modified. And this is based on our construction data collection application. And it just won the best of ITS award at the 2021 uh, ITS Heartland Regional Conference in November. Uh, so again, the guys are doing some really exceptional work around the ability to provide information to the traveling public. Uh, next slide. One of the partnerships that we have established is, is specific to Waze. And if you've ever used Waze, it's a very powerful uh, travel tool uh, it, because it's crowdsourced. It gets a lot of information from folks out traveling the highways. And uh, currently, we're able to pull and present Waze data on the accidents, traffic jams, and closures through our OK traffic map. And we are getting ready to be able to share back data on closures and work zones with Waze and some of the other uh, mapping systems. And again, this, a lot of times Waze and the folks that are traveling the system out there will pick up and report an accident that's happened out on the highway system long before it's even, it even gets to dispatch for emergency response. So uh, very powerful, most up-to-date tool there probably is out there. Uh, next slide. Uh, road Weather Information System, or ARWIS, is the Advanced Road Weather Information uh, system and it includes uh, 17 full ARWIS stations with additional probes and sensors. Uh, currently, this system is every 15 to 20 miles on Interstate 35 from border to border, and I-40 is being expanded over the course of uh, this next state fiscal year. Each has wind and precipitation measurement as well as five temperature devices, air temp, uh, bridge surface, uh, roadway pavement surface, embedded pavement temp probes, uh, subsurface temperature probe, and that data is used to help us predict when freezing conditions will occur on bridges in the surrounding areas. Uh, and that helps us with making good decisions about possible pretreatment uh, locations and allows us to get out there and, and uh, do some of that work corresponding with changes in the temperatures that we're experiencing out there on some of that infrastructure. Uh, the colder it is, the lower you will observe uh, in the pavement structure and the longer roadways can and will stay frozen. So uh, that's a system we pay unique attention to. Uh, next slide is road conditions. Uh, this is an extremely powerful part of the OK Roads app. And uh, it's a public site for road conditions during weather events used to report whether a road has moderate, severe, or closed road conditions. Uh, the data is entered by ODOT, OTA, and the Department of Public Services uh, OHP field personnel. Uh, point closures for location-specific issues are also included on this map. Usually that is a result of flooding. Uh, and this also is a link to our uh, snowplow cameras and, and snowplow images. 
that takes us to the next slide, mobile op snowplow mobile observation systems. Uh, this allows the superintendents to see where the plows have been and what has been plowed and when. It uh, has color-coded color paths that show the time since the last plowing, uh, provides plow up or plow down data and spreader dispersal rate information uh, along with the images through sensors that are actually built into the trucks. Full data and images are stored for department use, but the images are publicly published uh, to OK Roads and they expire after a two hour period. Uh, from a snowplow deployment perspective, uh, we've got about 330 ODOT truck systems uh, of the 550 total trucks that we have uh, that have this snowplow camera installed now and uh, 43 on the OTA trucks. Um, you know, as this technology continues to evolve and develop, uh, we're looking at moving, you know, right now it's a tablet-based system uh, that's got a forward-facing camera and we're looking at moving more towards maybe a cell phone app for the future. And then Drive Oklahoma app, uh, the department and Turnpike Authority partnered on this app and it provides the access to all of the features of OK traffic and OK roads uh, and it's in that modern mobile friendly platform, uh, including speed information uh, and there pretty much everything that we've talked about here, uh, road weather information and road uh, and radar overlay. Uh, the camera systems that we've got, uh, examples of uh, some of the live streaming are shown there on the, the screen. It's about a one minute delay uh, off of real time. So it's very close and it can be selected by the map uh, by city and highway uh, with cross street locations for any, any camera that you want to see. Uh, so we've got an array of very powerful tools out there on our uh, website. And the, these tools have been developed over time through a really tremendous effort by our ITS group Alan Stevenson, certainly Taylor Henderson, the maintenance division, and uh, in cooperation with all the district personnel. Uh, so pretty excited. Uh, this technology is always advancing and, and the guys are moving the ball forward all the time, uh, but this is getting better and better. These are things and tools that we could only dream about just a few short years ago, uh, and they're getting better all the time. Uh, I think one of the most important aspects of uh, our traffic operations is to really work closely with some of these mapping tools that are out there, whether that's Google Maps, whether that's Waze or some of the other ones that are that are being used by the traveling public every day uh, to make sure that we're leveraging that resource uh, and really getting all of the traveler information that we can out there and available to the public and paying attention to what's being reported back to us on those apps. So. Uh, we'll continue to cultivate those relationships and build out on them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to pause for a second and answer any questions that uh, anybody may have about some of these weather systems. Okay, the data sharing with Waze, is something like that, do we have the ability to um, either impose recommendations or constraints? So suppose, or is it completely crowdsourced? You know, traffic is gonna go where there's least resistance. Or do we have the ability to say maybe that's not a good route? Do, do we have that ability to, to impose a couple of recommendations? Commissioner, it, it's developing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we don't have necessarily that level of influence yet, but I'm very optimistic that at some point in the future, we are going to have those types of interactions uh, because you bring up a very important point. Uh, the one thing that can happen to you, and I've certainly had it happen to me, is the system may recommend a detour route that is not necessarily ideal for the traveling conditions that you want to experience. Right. Uh, and again, I think that's something that we all need to pay attention to uh, and be careful that it doesn't steer you somewhere where you, you don't necessarily want to go. Um, but I, I feel like the relationships that we're developing with those applications and the, the uh, folks that are developing them uh, will allow us to help shape that opportunity in the future. 
And again, the, the nice thing is that's as close to real time information as we can get. And for the little downside on maybe some of the route recommendations that are not ideal, uh, the benefit that they offer is pretty significant. Uh, Ways reports of crash, do you know how long that stays at the crash site? Based on the crowdsourcing, uh, it typically will stay until somebody says it's no longer there. So it so takes it, a positive action for somebody to say, this is cleaned up. Yes. Okay. All right. That's good. Mr. Secretary, on these apps that I've seen in the Google apps and the waves <clears> and this, I have noticed that, of course, I'm in trucking. They've got a lot of our truckers in the problem because they'll take a detour and they sure as hell shouldn't have got on that detour. Or they get for railroad crossings where they shouldn't be. They get into lots of problems and it's coming because of these apps. Yeah, and, and Commissioner, that's very similar to what we were talking about. The, the alternative routes are going to have to continue to be refined. Uh, and again, it's incumbent on us that are using those applications to really make sure that we feel like that recommended route's appropriate for us. Uh, because I've, I've done the same thing. I've on occasion been detoured through a residential neighborhood that I was uncomfortable uh, traveling cross country in. Uh, so, you know, things like that, we've got to be careful and uh, recognize that they're still developing. Uh, and hopefully that those types of situations will get better over time. Are you aware of any municipalities that are like cooperating with street data? Not specifically, but I, I'm certain that they are. Uh, and again, that the, the ways being crowdsourced, they invite the dialogue and partnerships with us and that's been extremely helpful. Thank you, very insightful. Just a couple of brief uh, points, Mr. Chairman. The uh, got a few task force updates. We've got a, a hydrogen production task force that transportation has been involved in uh, that presented its report last week to the governor and uh, pretty excited about that. Our involvement was predicated primarily on uh, alternative fuel corridors and some of the planning and initiatives that'll need to go on around that. And uh, we were pleased to be involved with it. Our GIS team, uh, who is exceptional, uh, they do a tremendous job for us and for the state of Oklahoma, uh, was involved in helping them do some mapping and uh, thought that went very well. So pleased to be a part of that. Uh, we had our first meeting of our Advanced Mobility Program Advisory Council. Uh, Commissioner Grimsley is a part of that, uh, that council. And uh, it was an organizational meeting, but I see the council being instrumental in uh, developing some policy recommendations, uh, potential law uh, change recommendations for the future as related to unmanned aerial systems, uh, and some of the advances we're seeing with intelligent vehicles, uh, telematics, uh, smart uh, traffic and transportation systems, and autonomous vehicles. So uh, we've got some work to do ahead of us, uh, but I'm really happy to have finally gotten our first meeting done with the Mobility Council. Uh, and then our Road User Charge Task Force uh, is continuing to move forward with our statutory obligation to consider uh, alternatives to motor fuel taxes for transportation revenue streams. And uh, the significant thing that we've done with the road user charge task forces, uh, we have prepared and submitted a grant request uh, to USDOT for some assistance with developing that pilot. Uh, and then on the transportation modernization front, our uh, organizational efforts, we have uh, completed the restructuring of our multimodal division. Uh, that includes our Office of Mobility and Public Transit, rail programs, waterways, and active transportation. Uh, we are working hard right now to stand up and uh, properly staff our Office of Innovation uh, that is leading our modernization efforts and will transition into a more broad IT technology and innovation role for our future. And uh, certainly, Joni has, has been a, a huge uh, part of making that happen. I want to recognize Jared Swinnison for his work on the multimodal division and modernization. Uh, he's done an exceptional job. Uh, and we're beginning to share more and more services across the agencies. 
uh, including uh, work in our materials lab, uh, work on payroll in our financial areas, uh, P-Card, uh, we're sharing best practices and trying to expand that operation uh, for utilization by the Turnpike Authority. Our office engineer now is handling the bidding process for the Turnpike Authority, and uh, certainly that's gone exceptionally well. The Turnpike Authority has adopted the ODOT spec book, so we're all operating on the same sheet of music there. And uh, our GIS function, our GIS team is offering uh, services across the cabinet for uh, a number of different uh, initiatives. And uh, yeah, geographic information systems, our team is, is now, and again, we've got one of the better GIS teams, not just in the state of Oklahoma here at the department, but in the country. Uh, they, they're very capable, and uh, those services are becoming more and more important to both Turnpike Authority uh, and aeronautics even. So uh, that being able to leverage that resource across the cabinet is important to us. Uh, and then audit. Uh, Holly Lowe, our uh, head of our ODOT ORE, has transitioned into a role at the cabinet level. And she now is head of internal and external audit for uh, the transportation cabinet. She'll be working across ODOT, Turnpike Authority, uh, and the Aeronautics Commission. So again, modernization continues to make good progress. Uh, we are leveraging more and more resources across the uh, transportation cabinet uh, to the benefit of our operational efficiencies. Uh, and uh, there will be cost savings as a result as a, as a uh, the modernization progresses. So things that we're pretty excited about. And uh, this is not a thing that'll be over with anytime soon. Uh, modernization is something that we'll continue to work on for many, many years and probably never really be done with. Uh, we wanna build the process of change and always looking for that next good idea uh, and really emphasize that in our culture in the transportation cabinet. So. Uh, We'll continue to work on that. We we'll very much appreciate your support uh, for those initiatives and the effort that we put forward. And Mr. Chairman, I think it'd be beneficial tomorrow, the Turnpike Authority Board meets uh, and we'll talk in some detail about a pretty major uh, Turnpike long range plan. And uh, the commission needs to be aware of that. Just uh, don't have a lot of detail to offer here this morning until we get past the board meeting tomorrow. Uh, but that'll be an item of discussion at subsequent Transportation Commission meetings. If so I offer that for your awareness. Mr. Chairman, uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that the commission might have of me and uh, very much appreciate you. I have a question. <clears throat> As the technology advances for driverless cars, I mean, I, I know that's out there. <clears throat> Will that be from satellite? or will it be from street markings? I think it's gonna be a combination of a lot of different things. Uh, some of it will be locational information that is, uh, you know, you can get pretty good accuracy even now off your cell phone and in the, the cell service. Uh, some of it will be satellite and more sophisticated applications, uh, but the, those driver assist technologies that are in your car now, like adaptive cruise control and lane departure technology. Those are pavement markings. Yeah, pavement markings and sensors in the vehicle. That's that telematics aspect where your vehicle is actually paying attention to what's going on around you. So if someone slows in front of you and you don't immediately pick that up, your car will auto brake sometimes, alert, alert you. Uh, those are powerful, powerful safety tools that will begin to make a difference, I hope, in driving our accidents down because we're not doing real good right now uh, from an accident perspective. But uh, so it's gonna be a combination of many, many different things. One of the biggest challenges that we are gonna be faced with in the transportation space, probably for about the next 20 years, is how do we manage all of the different types of traffic that we're gonna see out there? Whether it's an autonomous vehicle that is driving itself for the most part, uh, whether it's these vehicles that have some driver assist technologies and certainly Commissioner Dyson, our fleet's going to have to turn over before the, we find those types of technologies in all vehicles. Uh, 
Uh, so it's going to be a matter of how fast does that happen. Uh, and we're going to begin to see, uh, you know, folks out there that still are driving vehicles that don't have any of those technologies in them. So how do we manage all of those different traffic types out on a transportation system and continue to keep everybody safe and, and continue to keep traffic moving? That's not going to be easy. In the average car today, 12 years old. That, yeah, that's, that's going to be about right. So you got some 25, 30-year-old cars that don't have any, sure. anything at all in them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're uh, you know, this is not going to be something, and, you know, we hear a lot of discussion about electric vehicles now, and that is synonymous with some of the advances in technology that we see. Uh, most of those electric vehicles are really, really going to be smart. But how fast do we transition? You know, that's open for debate. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to take us decades uh, to really begin to make that transition in a meaningful way uh, where we start to see things like accidents impacted. And there are so many moving parts to that that are going to have to be addressed. You know, everything from uh, insurance and how do we manage that to just how do we manage our transportation system to make sure we can facilitate those types of traffic operations. Great question. Thanks. Any other questions? Just a comment, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary. Go ahead. Could I go back to my former statement I asked about the, the apps and that? I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is when they're developing these apps, can't they make an app, for instance, they can detour and it's very accessible for a car or a pickup truck or something. Can't they come up and say not accessible to trucks or accessible only to small vehicles or something that would that would mm -hmm. keep keep these larger rigs out of places that automobiles can go off these apps? Certainly not to speak for the, the smart folks that design and develop those apps. Uh, but I can't imagine that that's not within the realm of possibility. And I would imagine that it is being worked on. So uh, that's something that is a concern that we've got to look out for. You get a truck in there and you shut the street. The second option is get shut down. But they're done that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, I'd be remiss to not mention the ball on the pole outside. <laughs> we could, I, don't, I don't know if... Uh, Commissioner, you know, Alexander is hiding that uh, orange ball or if it's just been so long since it's been up there that it's lost. But uh, if we could do something about that, yeah. I'm sure we Can I object it. or is that a no. <laughs> it's, uh, point of order? I don't know. <laughs> well, Commissioner, uh, you know, Pistol Pete's a little busy right now. He uh, He's recovering from a really rough game that we had over the weekend. <laughs> Um, so we didn't weren't able to get him here today, but I can assure you the the uh, that orange ball has got a new coat of wax on it, uh, and it is going to look really good prominently displayed out there here shortly. So I, I, I don't know if all the commissioners know that this is an OSU tribe that's running this company. <laughs> <laughs> Any other wise comments up here? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. For Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, do, do we have any other comments from, from any of the Commission? If so, if not, do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. Do I have a second? Secretary, would you please call the roll? Mr. Coburn. Coburn, yes. Mr. Grimsley. Grimsley, yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Frymiller. Frymiller, yes. Mr. McCowan. McCowan, yes. Mr. Dyson. Dyson, yes. Mr. Alexander. Mr. LaFord. LaFord, yes. Mr. Peterson. Peterson, yes. We got a unanimous vote that we are adjourned. <laughs>